from the macabre minds of Laughing Devil Production comes another story from the Nightshade Diary. You know what that means. Check under the bed and make sure no one or nothing is there. Is the closet door securely shut? Then leave your disbelief behind, amp up your imagination, and hang on tight for another ride into terror and mystery. And like all good horror stories, just imagine it's a dark and stormy night. And remember, screaming like a little girl is permitted. The Skeleton in the Closet by Robert Block When I opened the closet door, I saw a skeleton. He was hanging there on the third hook from the left. I just shook my head and smiled. When I came to, I was lying on the floor. The closet door was still open. I raised my eyes timidly. On the floor of the closet, I saw a pair of rubbers, some old dusty tennis shoes, and two ancient house slippers. I glanced higher and noticed a raincoat, an overcoat, a pair of slacks, and an old hat hanging on the hooks. Also the skeleton. This time I didn't faint. I even managed to get up off the floor, but I couldn't stop looking at the horror. It dangled there, suspended by its spine from the hook, with bony body swaying to and fro. It was rather large for a skeleton, as skeletons go, and how I wish this one would. I noticed the unusually big bones, and particularly the face, or rather, the lack of face. The skull itself grinned a grisly grin. There was mockery in the hollow eye sockets and menace in the leering teeth. I wondered wildly how this skeleton had turned up in the closet. Had he been a human being trapped in there and eaten by moths? No because the door was unlocked. I sighed. This was just what I might expect to find in my uncle's house. He had been interested in sorcery, black magic. My uncle was quite an eccentric that way. Every Halloween, I used to send him a birthday card. Outside of that, we seldom communicated, and all I knew of him was through hearsay. Rumors of what went on in his big house in the country rumors about his unusual library of forbidden books and of the secret societies he was mixed up with. To judge from these reports, he was mixed up plenty. But I dismiss all that. When I received word of a sudden death a little while ago, the lawyer gave me a key to the house and said I'd inherited his estate. So here I am. And here was a skeleton. You can't stand looking at a skeleton forever. As for me, I can't stand looking at a skeleton. So after a moment, I sat down, sat down and poured myself a nice stiff drink. I raised the glass to my lips to shut out the sight of the skeleton hanging in the open closet. I started to gulp. Get me down off this damn hook and I'll join you, grunted a voice. I finished my gulp. The glass fell from my fingers as I started in startled horror at the closet. The skeleton was speaking. You've spilled your drink, the voice told me. I spilled another in a hurry, right down my throat, and then another. Talking skeletons? Was it alive? Come on, said the skeleton. Do you think I want to spend the rest of my life in this stuffy closet? The skeleton had a deep, sepulchral voice, I noticed. I wondered how he could articulate, though he was a well-articulated skeleton. Spend the rest of your what? I answered him through chattering teeth. You already spent your life from the looks of you. Toss it away never saw anyone with less looks of life about him. You shouldn't worry about stuffy closets. You need a nice stuffy grave. Well, I can't go to one unless you take me off this hook, argued the skeleton. I took another drink, from the bottle this time. 
The liquor combined with my fright and worked fast. His argument almost sounded reasonable, although the clicking of his bones sounded plain ghastly. Come on, says Skeleton Urge, lift me down. Who's going to hold me up while I'm lifting you down? I argued. What's there to be afraid of, countered the skeleton. If I had a mirror, I'd show you, I told him. I can't stand the sight of you hanging there. Then take me off the hook. I approached him gingerly and with trembling fingers hooked around his spine. I lifted him down and set him on the floor. The skeleton ran to the table with amazing and horrifying clarity. He scrabbled around and poured out a drink. Three fingers, three bony fingers. With clicking elbow sockets, he raised the glass to his lips, or to where his lips once were, and tossed the drink off. Where does that stuff go, I wondered. A lot, I said. Where did you come from? The skeleton faced me. What's it to you, he asked. Well, how would you like it if you came into a house, opened the closet door, and found a skeleton? I'd like it pretty well, he said. Then I'd have some company. I shuddered. I'm so lonesome, the skeleton complained. You don't know how it feels to be a skeleton. I don't want to find out either. You will, said the skeleton with a ghastly leer. Someday. I still want to know how you got into that closet. You might say I used a skeleton key, he told me. I might say the hell with you too, I replied. In fact, that's just what I do say. And I say let's have another drink. The skeleton poured. My hands were shaking, but I managed to drink. We clicked teeth rather than glasses. Here's looking at you, said the skeleton. Here's not looking at you, I answered. And speaking of this happy prospect, you've got to get out of here. You know, I can't have you hanging around this way. But what my friends think? Couldn't you tell them I was your family skeleton? He asked wistfully. After all, what can I do in my position? You can lie down and play dead. This is a bit unusual, I admit, the skeleton acknowledged. There isn't much precedent for it, is there? I wonder if we could get some help to figure things out. Well, we could read Thorn Smith's Skin and Bones, I suggested. He had a few remarks to make about a live skeleton. Only his case happened to be a man who turned into a skeleton and back to a man, intermittently. And the man was really there all the time. That is, his flesh was. He just looked like a skeleton. That wouldn't help me. I not only look like one, I feel like one. And I am one. The skeleton took another drink. I followed suit. For some reason or other, I was beginning to feel quite tipsy. It couldn't have been the liquor, or was it? At any rate, the skeleton no longer seemed so frightful. He no longer terrified me. I adopted a somewhat haughty attitude when I addressed him next. By the way, I observed, I'm not exactly in the habit of speaking to strange skeletons. May I ask your name? You might, said the fleshless one, but you won't get much of an answer, he hiccuped, rattling his lower jaw alarmingly. See here, I flared, who are you? Or rather, who were you? Damned if I know, the skeleton confessed. That's what's puzzling me. I'm afraid I can't remember. It's amnesia, I guess. Must have been in some kind of an accident. It was a pretty severe accident, judging from the looks of you, I told him. The skeleton shook his head mournfully. You don't know how you got in my closet, or why you're still alive, or who you are, I persisted. That's right. That's wrong, I corrected. It's contrary to all the laws of nature. You shouldn't be alive, and you certainly shouldn't be hanging in the strange closets. It doesn't bother me half as much as not knowing what my name is, the skeleton insisted. I'm really curious to find that out. Maybe I'd better call a morgue, I suggested, and see if they're missing you. 
There are the funeral parlors, too, the skeleton added. I picked up the phone and fumbled for the directory. Wait a minute, I said. I can't call these joints and ask if they're minus a live skeleton. The cops would be after me with butterfly nets. I'll have to think of another way. The skeleton regarded me with a grave look. What other kind of look would a skeleton have? I don't know, or care to know. By the way, speaking of names, you haven't told me your name yet, my friend. I blinked. So I haven't. I'm Tarleton Fisk. This is the house of my deceased uncle, Magnus Lorry. Magnus Lorry. Lorry. Bony fingers pressed into the skull. But that's my name. It came back to me now. I'm Magnus Lorry. This is my home. And you're my nephew. I'll be a monkey's... No insults, I warned him and gulped. You're my uncle, I said. I can't believe it. Why not? Otis Curson, your lawyer. He said you died of a stroke. You were buried in the family vault at Hopecrest Cemetery. Private funeral, and he handled all the details. There were no mourners present. No mourners? I'm the only one left in the family, I explained, and I was out of town. Otis Curson wired me. You left me this house and your estate. Nobody mourned for me, repeated the skeleton. How unfortunate to let a poor man die friendless like that. If I could have been there, I would have mourned. You weren't such a friendly fellow when alive, I said, blushing. You were something of a recluse, eccentric. You were a wizard, I believe you called yourself. So I was, exclaimed the skeleton. I do remember that. I was quite a sorcerer, wasn't I? Yes, I've heard it said. Maybe that's why I'm still alive, the skeleton mused. I might have had a premonition of death and cast a spell to preserve my consciousness. Perhaps. But it's funny. There's still a lot I can't remember to recollect. For example, I don't remember having a stroke. I don't recall anything about my death. That's not unusual in amnesia cases, I told him. Often a victim just recovers partial memory. The rest may gradually return. Stroke, mm, said the skeleton. Get me a mirror. What for? I want to look at myself. You're not worth seeing, I argued honestly. Get me a mirror, nephew. Very well, Uncle Magnus. I got him a hand mirror from the dresser in the bedroom. My skeleton uncle grasped it and stared at his reflection, shuddering the while. My, I'm gruesome, he exclaimed. I nodded. Rather repulsive, too. Definitely, I agreed. Hate to meet myself up a dark alley. Certainly would. Hey, the skeleton ran a bony phalange across the back of his skull. What is it? Look, the skeleton exclaimed. See this hole in my head? Where? Right here. What is it? I asked, knowing the round little opening in his skull. It's a bullet hole, gasped the skeleton. A bullet hole? Definitely. And you know what? What? I didn't have a stroke. I've been murdered. No, I gasped. Yes, this bullet must have gone clean through the medulla oblongata. Otis Curson or somebody was lying. I tell you, I was murdered. But why? How? That's not the point, the skeleton rasped. It's who? I'm going to find out if it takes the rest of my life. I mean death. Magnus Lorry rose to his bony feet and danced up and down excitedly while his vertebrae rattled like castanets. I'm going to track down the person who killed me, he yelled. And then what? I haven't forgotten my sorcery, he declared. I'll cook up a fate for my slayer that he'll never forget as long as he lives. And that won't be long. My unusual uncle grated his teeth unpleasantly. I averted my eyes in distress. Call that fat swine Otis Curson. 
Get that illegal eagle on the wire for me, he ordered. Obediently, I dialed the attorney's office. Mr. Kirsten, please, I requested. Mr. Kirsten is out of town, replied the stenographer's voice on the other end of the wire. He's gone to Buffalo for a convention. I reported the news. Buffalo! Hell and damnation, growled the skeleton. You suspect him? I asked. I suspect everybody, the skeleton groaned. I have no friends. Nobody loves me. Nobody cares. Might as well be dead. Don't cry, I said. I can't cry, he sighed. Can't even cry. But I can still act, and I'm going to. What do you propose? I think I'm going to do a little sleuthing. A little amateur detective work to find out who murdered me. He stabbed the bony finger in my direction. And you're going to help me, nephew. Glad to. How do we begin? We'll pay a couple of visits. Where to? We shall call on some of my rivals. Rivals? Rival wizards, my uncle explained. There are several others in this vicinity who secretly practice the mantic arts. Cheap sorcerers. All of them were jealous of me and my fine collection of incunabula. You have incunabula, I asked. Tons of it, he declared. More damned incunabula than you can shake a stick at. Doesn't it hurt? Incunabula are books written before 1600, my uncle explained. I have the finest library on sorcery extant. And some of these scoundrels know it. I'll bet one of them bumped me off, figuring my state would be up for sale and he could steal my precious manuscripts and formulas for a song. That must be it. Any idea who might figure such a plot out, I inquired. Well, there's the mighty Omar, said Magnus Lorry. Who is he? A spiritualist, and a fake spiritualist medium at that. He's just a charlatan who makes a living by holding fraudulent seances and playing the suckers. He's really interested in the occult, and knowing my real powers, he always hated my guts, when I had them, that is. Did you think that he... I've got a hunch, said the skeleton. Come on, we'll visit him first. He rose and clanked across the room to the door. Wait a minute, I protested. You can't go out like that. Why not? People will see you walking around. You must be disguised somehow. Useless, he told me. You can't disguise a face and figure like the one I haven't got. But you'll start a riot. Then you'll have to carry me, my uncle said. That's it. You can carry me in your arms. Say you're delivering a skeleton to a medical school. I'll play dead. That won't be hard for you, I sighed. But the idea of dragging a skeleton along the street in broad daylight doesn't appeal to me. Would you rather wait until after dark then, around midnight? Midnight is no time for me to mess with skeletons either. On second thought, we'd better go right now. I picked him up gingerly by his clavicles. Hold still now, I breathed. Carrying him down the hall, I kicked open the door walked down the driveway and put him in the car. Climbing into the driver's seat, I started the motor. Where to, I asked. He gave me the address and we were off. Luckily, the streets were not crowded as we drove into the traffic. Soon we moved through the winding streets of the fashionable suburban district where the mighty Omar had his residence. Halting for a stoplight, Uncle Magnus turned to me with a leer. Step on it, he murmured. I can't wait to appear before the mighty Omar. I'll scare him out of a week's growth. The mere sight of me ought to shake a confession out of the guilty mouth. Quiet, I panted. Do you want somebody to hear you talking? Stop turning your head that way. People will notice. As a matter of fact, somebody had already noticed. About the most unpleasant somebody I could think of. A big traffic cop loomed outside the window. Hey, he growled. What you got there? Just a skeleton officer. I'm taking it over to medical school. 
Did I see it move? He persisted, eyeing the bony skull with evident distaste. Perhaps the car jiggled it a bit, I hazarded. Oh, my mistake. The cop was about to turn away when Uncle Magnus gave vent to an unfortunate impulse. He hiccuped loudly. Instantly, the cop wheeled. What's that, he said. I hiccuped, I told him. Drunk, huh? Driving while drunk, he reached eagerly for his ticket pad. Not at all, officer. Just a little sour stomach. Oh. Uncle Magnus couldn't hold it any longer. He hiccuped again, his jaws moving visibly. Holy Ike, barked the officer. That skeleton moved. How could it move? I asked innocently. You know that such a thing is impossible. Oh, yeah? Well, it did move, said the cop. And it hiccuped, too. There's something wrong with that skeleton, I'm telling you. Something mighty wrong. That's why I'm taking it to medical school. The cop wasn't satisfied. His beefy hand came thrusting through the window, and he fingered Uncle Magnus's collarbone. What's the matter, officer? I asked nervously. Why are you fingering my skeleton? Is that your skeleton? Of course. Who else would it be? How can it be your skeleton? snarled the officer. Your skeleton must be under your skin. Well, therefore, persisted the cop with a warning gleam in his eye, this is not your skeleton. And if it is not your skeleton, then it must be stolen. What are you doing with a stolen skeleton, you grave robber? It was a horrible moment, and Uncle Magnus chose it for a demonstration. Take your pawing hands off me, you big lug, he groaned. I'm not his skeleton, and I'm not your skeleton. I'm my own skeleton, I'll have you know. And if there's any graves Rob, it's likely to be your own. Because I'm going to put you in one in a hurry. I had never seen a traffic cop run before. It was an enthralling spectacle. How a man could move so fast in those heavy boots, I didn't know. But he was really speedy. We drove away with equal swiftness. Uncle Magnus chuckled repulsively in my ear. Stop that, I warned him. For heaven's sake, cut out this business of frightening strangers. Just rehearsing for the mighty Omar, said my uncle. I'll really give him the business. We drove up to the imposingly gaunt frame house that served as residence and place of business for the medium. I parked and got out. Pick me up, whispered my uncle. Under your arm, and ring the bell. He had a butler before, but I doubt if he'll trouble us long. We'll go right in and interview our spiritualistic friend. Just let me handle him and everything will be dandy. Somehow, I doubted his last statement. But there was nothing else to do. Picking up Uncle Magnus, I started up the walk, carrying the skeleton under my arm. I rang the bell. The door opened. A bearded butler dressed as a Hindu peered out with rolling eyes. You wish to have audience with the mighty Omar, he intoned in a sonorous voice. I nodded. The door swung wider. The bearded butler caught sight of my bony burden. Lord save us, he shrieked. The Hans are done arriving. A moment later, I stepped over his prostate body and stalked down the hall. Uncle Magnus rattled with anticipation under my elbow. We faced a darkened doorway. Here, he whispered, let me down and we'll sneak in. We opened the door on pitch blackness. The seance was in full swing. Moving quietly, we entered the darkened room. My eyes slowly became accustomed to the dimness and soon I could see faint outlines in the gloom. Six fat women were seated around the large table with their hands resting on its surface. At the head of the table, like the collar at the bingo game, where these women really belonged, was the mighty Omar. 
The mighty Omar was a little dried-up man, dressed in a turban and an oriental nightgown. He had a face like a prune, and it didn't take long to see that he also had plenty of new wrinkles. At the moment, the mighty Omar was right in the middle of his set. In fact, he was just going into his trance. O oh, mighty Brahm, he whispered in the darkness, by the powers of Raja Yoga, I command thee, tear aside the veil. Let thy humble service enter the astral plane and commune with the shades of the departed. Uncle Magnus rattled angrily at my side, but made no move to interfere just yet. Ah, sighed the mighty Omar. I am going now. I am passing through. And who is that I see? Ah, yes, it is my psychic guide to the spirit world, Dr. Anabana. In a normal voice, he confided to ladies. Dr. Anabana is a low, plain spirit. He will summon the souls of your dear departed ones and give you their messages. Who wishes to speak to Dr. Anabana? The fat lady next to the mighty Omar cleared her throat nervously. Ask him about Grandpa, she quavered. Grandpa Ike's nod trotter. I will try, moaned the mighty Omar. It is hard, so hard, he breathed deeply. I have a lady, doctor, he said. A voice came out of the air. It was shrill, eerie. What does she desire? She wants to communicate with Ike Snodtrotter. Have you a Mr. Snodtrotter there? I shall see, said the high voice. If he is here he has a message for the lady, he will communicate with her by knocking the table. There was a long, ominous silence. Suddenly the table resounded with a furious rapping. Grandpa! Is that you, gasped the fat lady? Again a knocking. It is your grandfather, said the high voice of Dr. Anabana, the spirit guide. How are you, Grandpa? asked lady anxiously. How do you feel? Grandpa says he feels fine, said the high voice. And to prove it, he will play the tambourine. Sure enough. From out of nowhere floated a ghostly tambourine, lit by glowing phosphorescence. It sailed above the table in midair and suddenly clinked and clanked. You see, said the mighty Omar, abruptly coming out of his trance. But we must hurry, lest the astral spell be broken. Do any other ladies wish to commune with the departed? I wonder, said the lady at the opposite end of the table. I would like to see if you couldn't find my Aunt Agatha. We can try, said the mighty Omar, if Dr. Anabana is willing. What is your Aunt Agatha's full name? Agatha Flug. The mighty Omar cleared his throat. As he did so, I felt the skeleton moving away from my side in the darkness. I have a lady, doctor intoned the mighty Omar. Ten dollars to that lady, rasped a voice. What? muttered Omar in a flustered haste. I'm sorry, said the doc voice. Thought I was Dr. IQ. Dr. Anabana called Omar in puzzled tones. Do you hear me? Dr. Anabana had to leave, said the voice, which I now recognize as belonging to my skeleton uncle. Dr. Gillespie wanted him in the surgery. This is Dr. Banana speaking. I've come to take his place. What goes on here? yelled the mighty Omar. Then hastily realizing his position, he recovered dignity. Will you locate Miss Agatha Flug, please? he asked. To hear is to obey, said my uncle. He raised his voice. Hey, Aggie, he bawled. Company! This is most unusual, fluttered the lady at the end of the table. Are you sure your spirit control is on the right astral plane? Astral plane? mocked my uncle. 
I'm on an astral dive bomber, sister. Wait, you wanted to speak to your aunt? Well, here's the old buzzard now. Knock on wood. Sure enough, the rapping sounded on the tabletop. But it was a most peculiar rapping and conga rhythm. One and two and three kick, said a high voice, which came from my skeleton uncle, doing his best to imitate a woman. How do you feel up there, Aunt Agatha? breathed the woman at the end of the table. I'll show you how I feel, said my uncle in falsetto. I'll play you something on the flute. Incredibly, a silver flute, also phosphorescent, floated out over the heads of the mighty Omar and the ladies. Hit it, snapped my uncle. The flute began to play. Did you ever hear Pete go tweet, 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 on his piccolo? What the blue blazes, screamed the mighty Omar, forgetting himself. That's not my Aunt Agatha, wailed the lady. It's a demon, yelled the woman beside her. Oh, I felt something tickle me. She wasn't the only one. As the hysterical flute tooted on, several of the ladies began to giggle and shriek. The mighty Omar rose his feet. What in the hell is all this, he howled. Turn on the lights. It was a bad idea. The lights went on. When the ladies saw the live skeleton sitting on the mighty Omar's lap with a flute in his bony mouth, they didn't wait. Even as they rose to flee, the skeleton jerked one fleshless arm towards a curtain. He pulled a string. A tambourine and two horns fell on the table, along with a microphone, a loudspeaker, a sheet on a wire, and a midget who had been sitting concealed on a perch near the ceiling. I'm from the spirit world, yelled the skeleton. Any messages today or would you care to say it with flowers? The ladies weren't listening. They were running out of the room. The mighty Omar rose swiftly, dumping the living skeleton to the floor. He tried to dive through the legs of the departing fat women. A bony hand jerked him back by the collar. Come on, said my uncle. You called up a spirit, now give me a message. Let me go, whined Omar. Go back to hell or wherever you came from. Not unless you come with me, grated my uncle. What do you want with me? The medium was trembling. I'm taking you to see an old friend, rasped my uncle. An old friend named Magnus Lorry. But, but he's dead. I know, growled my uncle. And you murdered him, didn't you? N no, I didn't. Let me go, howled the fake spiritualist. I'm just a harmless medium. I never murdered Magnus Lorry. I just dabbled a bit in the occult. I never believed. I never knew. The skeleton relaxed his grip. I ought to take you anyway, he hissed, but I'll let you go this time if you promise me one thing. Anything, anything at all, sobbed the not-so-mighty Omar. Give up this vile racket, said the skeleton. Get a job in the war industries or something useful. Yes, I will, right away. The skeleton released them and stalked off. I followed. As we went down the hall, somebody rang the front door. It opened abruptly as we neared it, and to my consternation, I recognized the figure standing there in the twilight. It was the traffic cop who had halted us at the corner. Here you are, he snorted. I've tracked you down at last. Here we are, said my skeletonic uncle, turning and taking to his bony heels down the hall. I followed with some speed as I noted the revolver in the cop's pudgy hand. Back door, wheezed my uncle. The cop thundered behind us. Halt or I'll shoot, he bawled. We didn't, and he did. But by the time the bullet buried itself in the back door, we had slammed it behind us. At a dead run, we made for the car in the twilight. Where to, I gasped. The hell out of this place, directed my uncle. Gas rationing be damned. We whizzed into the street. The cop appeared and in the rearview mirror I noted that he was mounting a motorcycle. I turned a corner quickly. Guess the mighty Omar wasn't guilty, said Uncle Magnus. I'm not so sure, I told him. He was too frightened to lie out of it, argued the living skeleton. 
How did you like my act? It frightened me, I admitted. Good. If we can dodge this cop, I'll try it again. Who have you in mind? Dr. Eggkoff. He's a psychiatrist at the Army Induction Center. A psychiatrist? Yes. But his hobby is collecting demonolatra. Books on sorcery. He used to grab off items at the book dealer's shops. And he hated me. You want to go to the Army Induction Center now? I asked, whizzing through the earth. Material as I noted the cop on the motorcycle behind us. Afraid I can't, panted Uncle Magnus. Why not? Isn't it safe to get myself involved there, said the skeleton. Dr. Eggkoff is pretty nearsighted and a tough customer. If I visit at the Army Induction Center, he's liable to draft me. I tried to answer, but by this time the wailing of the siren on the motorcycle drowned out my reply. He's gaining on us, screamed my uncle. Nosy fool. I twisted and turned. We were now in the heart of the downtown area. The siren blasted and we drove hell for leather. The skeleton bounced around in the back seat. Stop that, he begged. Do you want me to get us both killed? I'm the only one who can be killed, I muttered. Do something. Lose them. I'm doing my best. The glaring face of the cop was clearly distinguishable despite the darkness. The sirens screeched in our ears. I skidded around the corner on a wheel and a half. Listen, yelled Uncle Magnus. I listened. Another wail rose to drown out the siren, a great piercing wail. At the same moment, the lights in the streets abruptly blinked and went out. In the office buildings around us, the windows winked into darkness. Don't you understand, I shouted. It's a blackout. Blackout? Yes, I have to pull to the curb and run for it with you. Where to? Must be a downtown air raid shelter nearby. If we hide on the street, the wardens will pick us up. There's a subway entrance, panted Uncle Magnus. Now! We ground to a halt as the sirens wailed. Leaping from the car, we streaked down the street. Behind us, the bewildered cop groped in darkness. Halt there, he bellowed. This way, I gasped. I saw the black mouth of a subway entrance loom out of the lesser darkness. We clattered down the stairs, I with my heels and the skeleton with his bony metatarsi. We're safe now, I whispered, pausing on the landing. It was dark all around us. Somewhere below, the crowd stood in dimly lighted safety. Can't go down further, grunted the skeleton. I don't want to be seen. I'm sure nobody wants to take a look at you, I assured him. But we're all right here. Somebody else came racing down the steps and we froze into silence. From the heavy footsteps, I deducted the presence of a stout man. I nudged the skeleton who stood close to the wall. In a moment, several pairs of high heels clicked down the stairs. Two girls, I judged from the tread. You all right, Mamie? giggled the first. Okie dokie by me, her companion replied. Gee, ain't blackouts thrilling? observed the first girl. Me, I'd like it better if I had me a sailor, Mamie answered, snapping her gum. Any sailors down here? the other girl tittered. The stout man and myself were silent. Uncle Magnus rattled his bones slightly, but made no other sign. What's the matter? Nobody sociable? complained Mamie. She moved closer in the darkness. Unluckily for her, she moved close to Uncle Magnus. Ugh! she murmured. What was that? What? inquired the other girl. I felt something cold. Cold? Cold and bony, explained the girl in puzzled tones. Then, oh God! What is it? I don't know. It's all bony. Like a skeleton. You're screwy, her companion diagnosed. No kidding. I did, Mamie insisted. This is a subway, not a graveyard, scoffed the other girl. Wait, I'll light a match 
and see who's getting fresh around here. Don't, I began, but too late. The match flared up. Uncle Magnus's leering skull stood out. With a scream duet, the two girls clattered down the stairs to the safety of the subway proper. In the darkness, I heard the stout man chuckle. Cute trick, he laughed. A mask, huh? Uncle Magnus was silent at my side. I answered, Yes, sir, it's a mask. I was on my way to a costume party when the blackout caught on. The stout man moved closer. Say, he boomed. I know you. You're Tarleton, aren't you? What? I muttered. Sure. Don't you recognize me? Otis Carson, I muttered. I thought you were out of town. You told me to get out, he said, but I didn't. Just left word at the office, that's all. After all, there's nothing to be afraid of, you know. Old Magnus Laurie is safe in his grave. Nobody knows anything. You have the estate, and we divvy up. I turned, but too late. Uncle Magnus had found matches in my pocket. Otis Carson saw the full skeleton this time. He screamed. In my grave am I, groaned Magnus Laurie. You forget that wizards have power? Laurie, wailed Otis Carson. You're back from the dead? Yes, said the skeleton through clenched teeth. This young scoundrel was humoring me, dragging me around in a wild goose chase. But I've found my goose, and now I'll cook it. I'm innocent, Otis Carson gasped. Utterly innocent. He thought of the idea, remember? He came to town secretly and slipped into your house while you slept. He brought a gun, shot you right through the head. We buried you secretly, and I faked the medical certificate. He made me do it. I tripped on the lower step. That was my biggest mistake. When the skeleton's fingers closed around my throat, I knew the end had come. All right, he snarled in my ear. Up we go to the car before the lights turn on. He turned, you too, Curson. Where are you taking us, I whispered. Home, said the skeleton. Home. Where my books are. My books with their spells, their incantations. I'm going to show you two a little practical experiment in sorcery. What do you mean? You'll see loaded my skeletonic uncle. You'll see turnabout is fair play. Then I passed out. When I came to, I was in this bedroom. I'm still here, writing this. Somewhere outside in the great house, a skeleton stalks amid strange circles, muttering chants. He will be coming for me soon, and for Otis Carson. I think I know what he intends. That's why I'm writing this, to toss it through the window. If you on the outside find and read this, come to my uncle's house. Magnus Laurie is the name. He probably won't be here. He must have some wizard's plan for a getaway. Never mind that. Just go to the bedroom closet and open the door. I have a hunch you'll see a skeleton hanging there. That skeleton will be Otis Carson. Never mind that either. But please do something about the other skeleton right next to it because it's probably me.